Winners of two in a row. The Spurs will be shorthanded tonight when they host the Toronto Raptors. Leading scorer Keldon Johnson is out with right calf tightness. Isaiah Roby will sit with flu-like symptoms. Devin Vassell remains out with left knee soreness. And Blake Wesley is out several weeks with a left MCL sprain. A fourth-year guard, Romeo Langford, earned his first start with the Spurs on Sunday. And he played some solid defense in the team's 107-98 win. He locked down Anthony Edwards on multiple occasions, and he disrupted big man Carl Anthony Towns in the post. Romeo feels the minutes will come if he can play solid defense when he's on the floor. I feel like that's one thing I can hang my hat on. Um, and it all began when, uh, when I was with the Celtics. Uh, that was the main thing I focused on was my defense because that was like the only way to get playing time. When he's healthy, he's super effective. You know what I'm saying? He has really long arms. He's very smart. He knows how to play the game. He knows where the extra pass is. He knows when to go under a screen and when to go over and, and matchups. And you know what I'm saying? I think he's done a good job of this year of just, you know, getting in the treatment room, staying in the weight room, keeping himself ready. Here's video rookie Jeremy Sohan for morning shoot around. He's been upgraded to available after dealing with flu like symptoms. Spurs and Raptors will go down tonight at 7 at the AT&T Center. Now the Raptors last played on Halloween night when they beat the Hawks 139 to 109. They outscored Atlanta 44 29 in the fourth quarter to blow the game open. Pascal Siakam is their leading scorer this season at 26.1 points per game. Gary Trent Jr. is next at 19.4 points per contest. The defending state champion Brandeis Broncos are moving on in their quest for a repeat after one round of playoff action. The Broncos defeated Steele three sets to one on Tuesday night to advance to the area round. Senior Emma Halstead and junior Austin Smoke led a lead a core of returners who have plenty of playoff experience playing at the Alamo Convocation Center where the Broncos won three playoff games last year. And that experience certainly helped them out against Steele. It really does help because it can be very intimidating to walk into a gym, especially like this one when you have a lot of people on both sides with even bigger crowds and people that are going to yell things right at you instead of just like for the other team. So really that experience does help a lot and it helps keep you calm and keep you focused on the game and not the outside. Just being in the state environment, there's a lot of people, they're screaming and there's the crowds going. So it just kind of keeps you just focused on the court and what really matters is winning. Broncos will face Lake Travis in the area around this Saturday at San Marcos High School at 4 p.m. San Antonio FC head coach Alan Marcina, goalkeeper Jordan Farr, and defender Mitchell Tainer were all named finalists for the 2022 USL Championship Awards. Marcina is a finalist for Coach of the Year. Farr is a finalist for Goalkeeper of the Year, and Tainter is finalist for Defender of the Year. Winners for Goalkeeper and Defender this year of the year will be announced Tuesday, November 8th, while the Coach of the Year will be announced Wednesday, November 9th. SAFC will be in action this Sunday in the USL Championship Western Conference Final with Colorado. Colorado Springs Switchbacks FC from Toyota Field at 7.30 p.m. Up two games to one. The Phillies will host the Astros tonight at 7.03 in game for the World Series. Philly won last night 7-0 on the strength of five home runs, including the 1,000th home run in World Series history, which I thought was pretty darn cool. Oh, that yeah. is cool. Unless you're an Astros fan. Unless you're an Astros you're probably like, yeah. From the history it standpoint. It could have been cooler. It's cool. It could have been cooler if the Astros hit it. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> All right, our case out Q&A is coming up next. We are talking to candidate for Bear County Judge Trish DeBerry. Stay with us. There are only two more days left of early voting, but they are typically the heaviest days for turnout. And then, of course, we have Election Day. So with time dwindling down, we're going to talk to the county judge candidates over the next two days. And first off, we're going to talk to the Republican candidate Trish DeBerry, who like I said, did I mention that time is running down before Election Day? She's actually out at Grady's Barbecue where they are holding campaign events, waving signs along uh, Bandera Road. And uh, Trish, thank you for joining us. I, right off the top, there are people at home right now who have not voted yet, who maybe haven't made up their mind who they're going to vote for for county judge. Your message to them. Clearly, we have been at polling sites all across Bear County and for the better part of seven months. You know, we've been at the doorstep, uh, we've been in neighborhood associations, we've been in church services. Uh, the mantra for the campaign has been being present and being relevant. And I think that's the most important thing of the conversations that we've had with people. As we look at who is voting, um, Republican turnout is very, very strong. We have a historic number of independents. 
who have turned out to vote in this election. And, you know, as I talk to people along the, you know, the campaign trail, and especially now as we look at, look, interest rates just went up one more time today. Inflation is a big, big deal to people. I talked to a gentleman at the grocery store yesterday who was like, can you believe the price of cat food? Uh, he's a custodian over in the Northeast Independent School District. And he said, unfortunately, I don't have any other choice. I mean, I got to dig into my pocket to be able to pay for this. Um, so he just shook his head and he said, look, we need different administration. We need different people in office. We need people to care about pocketbook issues, uh, which, you know, has been very, very difficult for people. So for you, what would be priority number one if elected? The challenge that you think is facing the county in the biggest way right now that you'd want to tackle immediately in office? Well, we have to continue to focus on property taxes. We cannot tax people out of their homes at the rate that we're doing right now. Look, economic development is really important for San Antonio and Bear County, and we look at 2050. We look at potential for 6 million people to be in this county. Uh, we've got to make sure that, like I said, we look at appraisal reform. We've got to go to the state. By the way, whoever takes over this seat, two weeks after we get into office, there is a legislative session. Um, I can guarantee you I will be up in Austin I will be in those hallways and I will be talking to state leadership about what we are doing to make a dent in property taxes, true appraisal relief. Because I think the misnomer is, look, we've done all we can at the county level. I'm very proud of the fact that I lowered the property tax rate as the county commissioner, the lowest it's been in 25 years. You know, teed up um, a homestead exemption, not only with the county, but with the Bear County Hospital District. But we have got to fight the good fight at the Texas legislature. That is where it begins. I've already had those conversations, but people want tax relief, especially in a time where inflation is out of control. You know, I, I moderated one of the debate, oh, not a debate, one of the forums between you and <laughs> Judge Sakai. I wish it would have been a debate on KSAP, but that's another story. But <laughs> I, I, one of the major issues between you two, there are many, but is the mm -hmm. county jail. Should mm -hmm. we build a new county jail somewhere other than where it is right now? Talk a little bit about why you think that's a good idea. First and foremost, I think it's a really good idea because we look at generational poverty. Um, the poorest zip code that we have here today in Bear County is 78207. It has been there and has been in that state since the 1980s. And guess where it is? It's right located behind the Bear County Jail. So as we look at the opportunity for not only revised and rejuvenated economic development, if the barrier to the west side, which is the Bear County Jail, was not there, what could we achieve? We could bridge the wage gap for people. We could pull people out of poverty. We could inspire economic development on the west side in a way that has never been achieved before. Because quite honestly, the west side of San Antonio has been forgotten. It has been dumped upon, not only because of where the Bear County Jail is located, and there's great work that's being done at Haven for Hope, but Haven for Hope and the homeless population in that area is a double whammy to folks that are living on the west side. And so how we approach that conversation regarding moving the jail, because it's also about humanitarian conditions within that jail that still don't exist today, and the opportunity for a conversation, a cost-benefit analysis, a return on investment associated economic development, long-term forecasting, we at least, look, I'm not gonna say no. We have to explore the conversation, just like we have to explore the conversation, perhaps, for a downtown baseball stadium, which by the way, may be on the near west side. Imagine what can happen. And it's not just about the west side. I am representing the entire county, but my feeling is a rising tide floats all boats. And if we can improve things on the near west side and the deep west side, it can only be beneficial to the entire county. Glad you mentioned the idea of a downtown baseball stadium. We spent a lot of time in this very segment yesterday talking with the mayor about that idea. Do you think that's a good one? You think that a baseball stadium should be located in downtown San Antonio? Um, look, at the very least, we have to explore the opportunity for economic development, the possibilities that exist there. It is not necessarily priority one. Uh, when I come into the office, like I said, we've got a rain in spending. We got to lock down the nuts and bolts associated with the county in a near three billion dollar budget. We've got to make sure that we're focused on small businesses and pulling people out of a post-COVID environment, which is hamstring small businesses. Which, by the way, 
85 percent of this economy is built on the backs of small businesses. When you look at what COVID did to them and the way that we appropriate money and what we're spending money on, we've got to be laser focused on small businesses. But when you look at the opportunity for economic development, the answer is not no. The answer is we need to explore the opportunity. We need to take a look at it and see if it made sense, makes sense. But what I will tell you is it is not going to be built on the backs of taxpayers. Is there anything that we need to look at election night when the first numbers come out that you'll be looking for that say, OK, we're going to win this? Well, I think as we look at turnout, which has been very, very robust, I mean, look, turnout regarding the voting and the polling locations, uh, precinct three, which is the precinct that I represented as a county commissioner, turnout there is beating precincts one and two combined. Uh, typically, that is a heavy Republican turnout area. When you look at that combined with the fact when I talked about, you know, independents um, are almost outpacing Democrats regarding turnout and based upon trending, the independents are leaning more Republican. So I think we're going to look at a tight race coming out of early voting, but we also know the Republicans love, love, love. It's a scary, scary case for a candidate. Love to turn out on election day. So if we have a very tight race on early voting that comes out, you can bet that on election day, we're going to carry this election with Republicans in 2022 on election day in November 8th. So that is what we will be looking for on Tuesday. All right, Trish DeBerry, Republican candidate for Bear County Judge. Thanks for sharing some time with us here this evening. Hope you get a chance to enjoy some barbecue while you're out there at Grady's. <laughs> right. Hey, and, come, uh, on out to, come on out to Grady's. It's a prime example of a great small business, a locally owned business here in San Antonio with great, great brisket. And also make sure you get out and vote if you haven't done so already. Yes. We'll be talking yes. to you, you on Tuesday, Trish. Right. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. Thank Bye, you. Home. We'll be right back. A UTSA course diving deep into the history of Day of the Dead. It's created an exhibit at the Institute of Texan Cultures downtown. Our Tiffany Huertas gives you a preview. Learning about the ofrenda, how each layer symbolizes something different, you know, it brings you a new perspective, you know, of what the history is. UTSA student Ricardo Ayala is part of the UTSA Honors College Day of the Dead seminar class that created this space. Throughout the weeks uh, of September, we started planning. And the students build an altar known as ofrenda and other traditional elements for the exhibit at the Institute of Texan Cultures called Recuerdos Eternos, a journey back home. Professor Allegra Lozano says it's the fifth year the university has offered this seminar class that teaches about the Day of the Dead. It's all about the history, the commercialization, the globalization, the rise in popularity, but it's also about death, dying and grieving and the perspective of it through the lens of Day of the Dead. The exhibit is interactive. Here they have El Arbol de la Vida, the tree of life, where someone can come and get a leaf, write the name of their loved one, and then someone will place it on the tree. With this exhibition being interactive, it's a way for them to maybe learn about something that they don't see as often as we see it here in San Antonio. The exhibit is open until Saturday. Lozano says the class is having an impact on students. Um, a lot of students have made comments to me um, that it has really changed their kind of perspective and changed their life. Um, several students have said now that they um, are more engaged and practice it more on a yearly basis. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam, plenty of gray clouds out there, and this gray may be sticking around for a bit, Adam. Yeah, it's a uh, time of year where when we have the humidity around, we often see fog, and that's going to be the case and a very common trend. I know we had it this morning. We'll have it again tomorrow morning to affect parts of the morning commute. 75 right now by 8 o'clock down to 70. Then by midnight, we're at 67. I think we'll just stay there the rest of the night. So kind of spring-like. The next couple of mornings that however changes for the weekend. I'll tell you how so and give you an update on our thoughts of Friday evening storm chances in just a bit. Fog, humidity, fluctuating morning temperatures and an update on our storm chances. Let's get right to it and start with our rain chances. First of all, you see that 20% tomorrow and even into Friday. It's just for a few sprinkles. 
not a big deal. Even if you get that dampness, it's not going to add up to anything. Unfortunately, it's more nuisance precipitation Friday night, Friday evening. We have that 30% chance and that's for some thunderstorms. We were talking about this yesterday and we'll of course have more clarity into tomorrow. So check back for updates. But the way we see it right now is most of the action is going to be north of us. We could be right on the tail end. So let's talk about the overall pattern. Big dip in the upper level flow over the West Coast. It's stirring things up. These troughs, that's what they do. They lift the air, get the clouds and showers going. So widespread rain and then even higher elevation snow. Well, this is going to dig southward, but not exactly put itself in the best positioning to boost our rain chances. Most of the energy is going to stay to the north of us. And even with the cold front moving through, I anticipate a long line of thunderstorms. I mean, we're talking from basically Minnesota and Wisconsin all the way down into Texas. It's just how deep into Texas does that line stretch? We're going to be right on the tail end of that activity. So basically a quick glancing blow or nothing at all Friday evening. Here's our future cast right now, and we're still too far out for the high resolution data, which usually gives us more clarity. But you know, it's one of those situations we will be right on the tail end, pretty close to the action. Most of it's going to be to the north. And should we see that develop, then there is the potential for a severe storm. The time it would be roughly 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. for a narrow line of storms, maybe even a broken narrow line to quickly move through. Rainfall looks pretty minimal, particularly because we're not expecting a whole lot to develop in terms of showers and storms. So most of us dry, but if you get hit by one of those brief storms on along the narrow line, maybe a quick quarter to a half an inch if you're lucky. We're watching for the off chance of a severe storm or two with a straight line gusty damaging wind being the possibility. Right now we give it a 30% chance of this really coming to fruition. But again, check back for updates tomorrow and again on Friday morning as we'll get more clarity. 75, the current temperature, but here's the key. Dew point is 62. So the air temperature is going to drop down to that dew point. And actually the dew point is going to come up a little bit tonight. So bottom line, air temperature, dew point, they meet. That means the air is saturated. And then that leads to areas of fog. So Dewey's right now in the 60s and we're anticipate visibility to be reduced for the morning commute. Notice our future cast probably visibility around two miles to even under two miles here and there throughout the morning commute by about 10 11 a.m. though we clear out and we'll actually have some sunshine out there as well. It's a time of year where we often see fog because of the longer nights and when we have this high humidity, it just gives the fog longer to develop. So we'll get it the next few mornings, Thursday and Friday, not this weekend, lower dew points, not enough humidity out there, but it's back by the Monday morning commute. Quick look at temperatures. Well, 70s for the most part, a few 60s on the map. It's comfortable outside. I mean, Catula 73 degrees, 75 in town right now. Tomorrow morning, we'll start the day at 67 by the afternoon. Once we see that sunshine, we'll boost into the low to mid 80s, 83 Stone Oak and about 84, 85 on the south side of town. Again, a dreary start, fog and some sprinkles, a little bit of dampness. Then afternoon sun, same story on Friday. The weekend fall like, I mean, Sunday morning near 50 with an afternoon high of near 80 all weekend. Looking good. Thanks, Adam. All right, Starbucks and then I, am I saying Adele's name wrong? The buzz is coming up next. Mm. In the buzz today, coffee lovers, it is time to get into the holiday spirit. Starbucks has unveiled its new holiday cups. Starting today, customers will have their hot beverages served in one of four festive cup designs. Starbucks also starts serving its holiday drink menu. Now that's more Christmas. We haven't even had Thanksgiving yet. I know. Okay. No new drinks being added this year, though. You can enjoy the usual peppermint mocha or chestnut praline latte. There's a new sweet treat being unveiled, though, a chocolate pistachio swirl roll. Okay. I think they should wait till Thanksgiving or have a Thanksgiving <laughs> one. All right, Adele has some news for us. All these years we've been saying her name wrong. While many pronounce it like I just did, Adele, the singer says it's actually Adele. A what? She noted that the correction during a recent Q&A session, she said when a woman was asking her about her songwriting, she used the correct pronunciation. The event was held to celebrate her new music video for the song, I Drink Wine. Now up next for the singer, her Las Vegas residency weekends with Adele. It that just feels, that feels wrong. 
But anyway, weekends with Adele Adele starts November 18th. I mean, I guess it is her name, so we should say I know, the way we she should, wants us to say it. Exactly. Adele. Yeah. We'll be right back. That is all our time. Thanks for watching the News at 6. Adele. <laughs> Adele. Adele. Adele.